This is Congressman Bill Cassidy. I'm also a doctor. I'm an associate professor of medicine with LSU Health Science Center. I still continue to teach medical students and residents. And so I come to you right now as a doctor who happens to be the congressman representing the 6th Congressional District of Louisiana. And I am addressing you today on the CARE Act. First, let me give the background and history of the CARE Act. Why is it necessary? Next slide, please. As I suspect everybody watching this knows, currently credentialing for nuclear medicine and molecular imaging technologists is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. 30 states in the District of Columbia have licensure or regulatory provisions for nuclear medicine technologists that are either by the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists or the Nuclear Medicine Technology Certification Board. 20 states do not regulate at all. Next slide, please. And here is a map showing which states do and do not have regulatory provisions for nuclear medicine technologists. Blue do, red don't. Next slide. Now as regards imaging, poor imaging is costly. So if we're going to speak of the rationale for having minimal standards for uh, radiologic technicians uh, as regards imaging, there's an estimated 4 to 7 percent of diagnostic regulatory procedures that are repeated due to poor imaging technique or poor positioning. Now put this in context of 130 million exams done annually on about 30 million Medicare beneficiaries. The federal government is spending about $2.4 billion to do these. By avoiding these repeat scans, theoretically, the federal government could save $132 million per year. Next slide, please. And this is a public health issue. This is a patient health issue. Even when done correctly, CT scans, the radiation dose, if you will, are associated with an increased risk for cancer. Poor quality images can lead to misdiagnosis, delays in treatment, unnecessary radiation exposure, and needless anxiety for patients. We all know this. We've seen it in our practice. Next slide, please. Now, I have the privilege, I have the privilege of serving on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And in 2012, uh, different people came to testify on behalf of the CARE Act, one of whom was Dr. Leonard Gunderson. Uh, and I will quote from his testimony. Without a minimal level of standards, patients are at risk. The CARE Bill sets education and certification standards for the radiation therapist, medical physicist, and medical dosimet dosimetrist who speak Medicare and Medicaid patients, and Dr. Gunderson was representing at that time ASTRO. Next slide, please. Dr. Smith Byman spoke at that same meeting regarding uh, diagnostic imaging, and her group has performed studies of patients receiving CT scans and the amount of radiation they receive. And she found that for every type of CT scan, the radiation doses were far higher than the physician or the physicist actually thought they were. Next slide, please. And they found that, and I will quote, hundreds of thousands of cases have been reported where patients who underwent CT scans of their brain were exposed to radiation doses that were 100 times higher than intended or needed. Many of these errors happened because of errors in how the technologist programmed the scanner, a compelling case for that extra training the CARE Act asked for. Next slide, please. So what is the content of the legislation? That's what we'll discuss next. Next slide, please. Here are the basics. First, it sets minimal federal standards for the education and certification uh, for those technical personnel providing certain tests upon Medicare patients. Uh, this would be all those who deliver medical imaging exams or radiation therapy examinations. It also establishes a program uh, for certification by designating those organizations which could provide such uh, certification and publishes the approved or the uh, a list of approved accrediting bodies for such certification. Next slide, please. It is important to know who is exempt. These are physicians, physicians assistants, and nurse practitioners. So if in your training you learn how to do an ultrasound or an echo, it is presumed that your training is adequate that you would be able to both perform the exam and then bill Medicare Part B for performing such exam. Next slide, please. Now, it's important in legislation to have definitions. 
And you can see on your slide now the definition used in the legislation of imaging, and I will read. Any examination or procedure used to visualize tissues, organs, or physiologic processes in humans for the purpose of detecting, diagnosing, treating, or impacting the progression of disease or illness. Now it's important to note that the legislation does not include dental or ophthalmologic exams, um, uh, routine exams if you will, and uh, it does not, also does not uh, include ultrasound uh, guidance for accessing a, a vascular structure. Next slide please. And its teeth, if you will, is linking this to reimbursement. Those facilities seeking Medicare reimbursement for the technical component of an imaging exam or a radiation therapy exam must attest that their personnel meet these minimum standards before the payment is made. Next slide, please. Let's go through the history of the exam, excuse me, the history of the legislation. Next slide, please. It was introduced this, con this Congress by Ed Whitfield, a Republican from Kentucky who's on the Energy and Commerce Committee, as well as by John Barrow, a Democrat from Georgia, uh, who's also on uh, Energy and Commerce, and Allison Schwartz, who I believe is on Ways and Means, and she is a Democrat from Pennsylvania. So this has bipartisan support. Now I will note, this is the eighth time it has been introduced in the last 13 years. Every Congress, if you will. Next slide, please. Most times, it has died in committee. In 2006, it actually passed as a standalone bill, the Senate by unanimous vote, but was not taken up by uh, the House. Next slide. Now, that said, there has been previous federal um, uh, regulation of radiologic procedures, if you will. In 2008, there was the Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act, uh, our shorthand is called MIPA, and um, that has some flaws though. And I will quote a recent article from Radiology. A significant limitation of the regulatory scheme under MIPA is the exclusion of hospital-based imaging facilities from the accreditation requirements. The CARE Act, or bill, would address this shortcoming by extending federal education and certification standards for technologists to hospital-based imaging facilities as well. Next slide, please. Now this bill has broad-based support, and this slide lists those which provide such. Uh, next slide, please. So you may ask, why such, a, why such an important bill addressing such an important need is having such a difficult time getting passed? Uh, let's review those. Next slide, please. First, there are political challenges. Uh, medical organizations are concerned about issues of federalism. And frankly, there may be some compromise on that in the legislation which is introduced. Currently, medical legislation, medical licensing is regulated at a state level, and many feel this is an important place to leave it. Is there a slippery slope? Will there be nationwide credentialing of physicians, for example? On the other hand, it is important to note that there has been uh, previous federal legislation regarding radiologic procedures. One we just referred to, the MIPA Act of 2008. And then in 1992, there was legislation requiring minimal standards for the performance of mammography. Now this makes sense. We know that um, if there's anything that can um, uh, increase anxiety, lead to misdiagnosis and unnecessary procedures, it would be the performance of mammography. So that we have a precedent in terms of uh, radiologic procedures with the same rationale that is being used to support the CARE Act. But nonetheless, as it goes through the legislative process, this will be an area of focus. That said, let me say one more thing. The legislation um, specifically says, however, that it does not attempt to, uh, nothing in this section shall be construed to diminish the authority of a state to define requirements for licensure, certification, or registration, the requirements for practice, or the scope of practice of personnel. So the legislation attempts to address this but I can promise you this will, be an, uh, this will be an area that's examined. Next slide, please. And the bill does provide um, uh, methods of compliance, if you will. If a state does not want to set up its own licensing board, there can be certification by a recognized non-governmental organization. The state will still have the license, the ability to license someone to practice, or can grandfather those who 
have been previously performing such procedures or therapies uh, uh, grandfather these folks in. Additionally, there will be a lead-in time giving states, employers, and individuals time to comply. And lastly, the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services will have the ability to carve out exceptions, if you will, imagine a rural area where there's an issue of patient access because of, a difficult, because of difficulty attracting someone who would otherwise be certified. The Secretary of HHS will have the ability to make certain exceptions. So there is an effort to accommodate special situations. Next slide, please. What is your role? Now I'm going to speak as a congressman who just happens to be a doctor. My congressional colleagues do not usually come from a medical background. They will not necessarily know the importance of this bill, the rationale of it, or even the legislative history. In a representative democracy, someone who represents can only represent well if those represented come and make their representation. I hope that's not too convoluted a statement. But our responsibility as healthcare providers is to go to our members of Congress, our senators, and ask them to become acquainted with this. You may speak to your congresswoman's legislative assistant. That's okay. Uh, they're the ones who oftentimes filter and pass this information along. If you happen to live in a state or a district where the person who represents you is a member of leadership or on um, a committee of jurisdiction in the House of Representatives, again, that is energy and commerce and ways and means, make a particular effort to convey to them the importance of this bill. It may not go through a standalone legislation, the CARE Act, but rather it may be tucked in with another larger bill addressing issues of Medicare. But it will not happen at all unless those who have influence have your have acquaintance with, what, with the knowledge that you and I take for granted. That it's important to have adequate education and training for those who are performing these procedures. That it can save money and most importantly have a positive impact upon patients' health. Uh, there's no escape of the need to educate those uh, who may not know, have particular backgrounds in these things, but will be the ones who are ultimately um, passing the legislation. So I'll leave you with that as being our responsibility as not just citizens of the United States of America, but particularly as those who help tend to our health. Thank you and good luck on the exam.